The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. We welcome those that are watching online. We're excited about the day and what it holds for us, what the Lord has for us. And we invite you to just clear your mental calendar, your to-do list, and all those things. And just allow the Lord to speak to your heart, to your situation in life. He knows all about it anyway. So let's come to Him and ask Him to care for us, to speak to our hearts, to our situations. But let's also bring him praise this morning. Father, we thank you for this day and for this opportunity that we have to be in your house. We ask, Lord God, that you would come now and would deal with us as individuals. That your love would be upon our lives. That we would be able to acknowledge your presence. We give you permission to deal with us, to speak to us, to encourage us. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship him together this morning. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the same the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more oh to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing love, just in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. 
We're glad you're here this morning. Glad that you're watching online. We've turned towards the Easter and follow-up. Easter changed everything. And so now we have life after death. What is this new life? We're living in the shadow of the cross and of the tomb. What is this new life that we have before us? Because Easter changed everything. Easter can change our past, it can affect our present, and it certainly can uh, control our future. You know, we can't take care of our past until we've taken care of our future. Before we can reconcile our past, we have to be right with God. And Easter made that possible. Too many people try to make their past right before they get right with God, and you're doing it backwards. you are never reconciled your past until you've been reconciled to our Heavenly Father. We, we can correct our past. We can be satisfied in our presence only when we trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So Easter has changed everything. How then should we live? How should we live as children of the resurrection? We've been raised to a new life. The power of sin and death have been vanquished, conquered, destroyed. And there is a new life that is available to us. Now last week, thinking along the same idea of life after death, we discovered that we were a slave to sin. That we had been enslaved and unable to free ourselves. But after the resurrection, we are now enslaved to grace. But there remains that problem of rebellion in our lives. But there's an answer to that, surrender. So this morning, we look at this new life. Romans chapter 6, verses 19 through 22, just the second half of that uh, chapter that we looked at last week. There Paul writes this. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves. Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you're now ashamed of? Those things resulted in death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. This new life that we have been called to is a life of holiness. And a life of holiness has benefits that we reap when we step across from this life to the next. We may not be interested in our holiness, but God is. We often say God loves us just as we are, but he also loves us enough that he won't leave us where we find him, that he will continue to move in our lives, instructing, guiding, correcting us. He is so concerned that he works in our life to call us to a life of holiness. He convicts us, and he corrects us. So what is holiness? Well, the short answer is holiness is obedience. Why was Jesus holy? Because he lived a life of obedience. Always following the plan, the mission, the commands of his Father, even when it cost him, and it cost him dearly. He was always obedient. So we can live this life of obedience like Jesus did. We can obey God's Word, and that's why it's so important for us to be students of the Word, because it tells us about God and what God has for us, the plan that he has for us. Joshua could only 
prophesy to the people of Israel and say, He has plans for us, plans for us to prosper. But now that we have Jesus, and now that we have the power of the Holy Spirit, and now that we have the Word of God, we can see those plans fleshed out for us. We can turn to His Word and discover what God would have us to do. Obedience. Holiness is simply being obedient to the Lord God Almighty. Now, the long answer, what is holiness, the longer answer is this. It is an undivided heart. The Old Testament people would say, Lord, that you'd give me an undivided heart. A heart that's not divided between this life and the next. Not a heart that's divided between your will and my will. But a heart that is single-mindedness. It's developing a single-mindedness towards God that directs our living. And we'll talk about more. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. So what is holiness? It is obedience and it's an undivided heart. So why do we need to be holy? Is it critical? Is it essential? Is it demanded of us? Yes, it is. We are to be holy because holiness does many things for us. Holiness produces purity. And purity is a matter of the heart. Purity of heart is to will one thing, and that is to do the will of our Heavenly Father. When we talk about purity, it is our heart that directs our feet. We talk about thinking about things, but it is our mind that directs our thinking. Lord, that you would give me the desires of my heart. You can think of it like this. Lord, this is what I desire. Please give it to me. Or, Lord, my desire is for you. Please tell me what I desire. Purity is about intention. That God looks on the inside. That he looks at a person's heart. Now, that's good news, and that's bad news. It's good news in this. You can be going along just fine and do something dumb, a mistake that you didn't intend to do. And God looks on that and says, I know know your heart. And I know that the intention of your heart was to do good and to obey me. That's good news. Because you do dumb things and stuff happens and you you get guilty about it or you you feel blame about it. And the Lord says, I know your heart. I know that your intention was for good, not for evil. Well, that's great news. Apply that to your life. Now, here's the other part. Here's the bad news. We do good things, but we do them for the wrong reasons. We act like we are following the Lord when actually we're following our own desires. And the Lord says, yeah, I see what you're doing, but I know your heart. And your heart's not good. You get accosted by somebody on the street and they want 10 bucks. And you just give it to them. And the Lord says, yeah, that's not an act of charity. That was an act of anger. You're just trying to get rid of them. Why did you not talk to them and see what their real problems were? God can see the good when we do dumb stuff. And God can see the bad when we act like we're doing good because he looks at the intentions of our heart that purity brings about above reproach it brings about blamelessness that we live in such a way that no one can come and say to us you're a bad person rather they come to us and say tell me about the hope that is within you In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24, Paul writes there, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. How quickly did we learn this phrase as children? I did not do it. Except we usually said, didn't do it. I didn't do it. Young or old children said, I didn't do it. 
Or we said, not my fault, not my fault. Recently, my sister and I were talking, and we were talking about uh, a specific stork statue that was in our house in, Nash, in uh, Hendersonville, Tennessee. Right before we moved, my mom ordered all this furniture for the house, and we just moved it to Nashville. And there was a stork sitting on pilings, like three pilings, you know, about two foot high. And it had a very prominent place on a low boy. I, I hate to just use furniture terminology, but it was a low boy, and this uh, figurine sat on this thing. Now, this is back in the late 60s late 60s and one day my mother and father were gone and they put my sister in charge which immediately said to my brother and I we must push her to the point of breaking nothing was spoken verbally but there was this connection between my brother and I and we got straight to work it ended up with her and I don't know how this happened but she's chasing us through the house Swing it her purse at us to get us under control. Let's jump ahead. One swing of the purse took the stork out. Do you know how quickly the bond of brother and brother and sister changed? Now it was the three of us against the wrath of mom. There was no blaming. There was no, it wasn't my fault. It was your fault. You made me do it. We got Elmer's glue. And we spent time attempting to put the stork back together. It got put back together 99% of the way. Okay, so that was in 15, so there, let's just say 70, that's 30. 45 years later... We're in my father's house, my brother, my sister, and myself, and up on his bookshelves is the stork on the pilings. And right here in the neck of the stork is the missing piece of porcelain. Everything is an off-white except for this glaring white little speck, the speck we could not find. The one time in the life of the Davis children that we did not publicly say, look what they did. Because we were all at fault. There was blame enough for everyone. As far as I can recall, after my dad passed, no one, and my mother had passed, no one wanted the stork. It still sits in that house to this very day. We're so quick to lay blame, to excuse ourselves away from it. But when we come to the Lord and we live after Easter and we are living the new life, the life after death, there is a life to be lived that can be blameless. The kind of blameless that Paul talks about in 1 Thessalonians. That you be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because blamelessness is a matter of of the heart. An undivided heart is an ongoing goal in our lives, or it should be in our lives. As we examine our inner life, we find areas that are in conflict with God's plan of holiness. As a young believer, those things are quite easy to find. There are glaring discrepancies in what we have and what He wants we'll notice quickly that where we hang out changes. Our living changes. Our language changes. How we think about things change. We're just different. Things are totally different because we've come to Christ and has asked for forgiveness, and we have found ourselves pleasing God. Some are easier to find than to remedy, though. You see, there are other areas in our hearts that aren't as easy to overcome. They are deep-seated, but they still need to be surrendered. And I was, as I was working through this, I'm like, what, what would that be? What, what, what would be the hard things? Well, fear would be one of them. 
fear of the future, fear about money, fear about your safety. In all these things that God has said, hey, I'll take care of you. But we have fear. And we get spiritual and we'll take fear and we'll take it and we'll lay it down at Jesus' feet and then we'll stand guard over it with him, you know. Here, Jesus, I'm laying this at your feet so that you'll take care of it. I'm just going to stand right here in case you need help. And so fear is not displaced. It's just still there. Something else would be career. The concern that, well, if I gave myself totally to the Lord, what would I do about the career that I want? What would I do about my future? What about my retirement? And so we, uh, we deal with that another day. Like most of the deeply seated things, we push them off. Hey, in your house, do you have that closet? I'm not saying that we have this closet. Not in our house. But I'm just saying I've been in houses and people say, oh, don't go in there. Don't, don't go in there. Because that's where they put everything. Mean people put the bowling ball up on the shelf so that when you open the door, the bowling ball falls out. Have you ever been, ever been, ever been in that house? Not that I've ever done that. I'm just saying I've heard stories. But they put all the stuff they want to hide into that closet, and that's the stuff that just don't go in there, okay? Maybe as a husband, your spouse has said to you, oh, no, 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 that, don't look in there. It's not in there. I, I know what's in there. Don't. And what they're saying is, if he opens that closet, and that stuff springs out of there, we're going to have to have a discussion. And nobody is going to be happy at the end of that discussion. We think we can hide stuff from God, as if God can't find all the stuff we have. Sometimes it's relationships. We just are with people we shouldn't be with. We're, we're just a part of a group we shouldn't be a part of a group. But it's comfortable and it's nice, and so we just... Put that off a little bit. Stuff that in a sack and put that in a closet. And we hope that God just overlooks it. But this is what I've discovered about God in my life. He doesn't overlook anything. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't have that problem. He sees everything. Knows about everything. And what he wants for me is not my sacrifice and self-suffering. He wants me to live a life that prospers and is better. And I have found this to be true. When a decision has to be made and my wishes and desires are one way and God's plan and desire is another, it's always best to go with his plan. He knows a little more than me. He sees a little further than I do. He's got more wisdom than I could ever hope or imagine. And every time he plans something for me, it's what's best for him, best for the kingdom, and it's best for me. These are all the examples of deep-seated, hidden things that we try to hide from God and keeps our heart from being single-minded, of being a heart that is totally pure. Well, holiness also produces power. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. The kids are talking with Jesus. And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in, in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Were they thinking about being witnesses in Jerusalem? Forget Samaria and the Judea and the rest of the world. Do you think they were thinking about being witnesses? No, they were thinking about, oh, the Lord God, we're, we're going to clean house now. You know, what, you know what they thought? Let me speak for them. Everyone's going to know that we were right and they were wrong. Isn't that what's going on here? Wasn't that really their desire? We, na, I'm sorry, in the Hebrew, it's nana, nana, boo, boo. Nana, nana, boo, boo. We were right. You were wrong. Our Messiah is going to come in and he's going to clean house. And you know who's going to be right by him? The 11 of us. We're going to be right there with him. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. He said to them, 
You're going to get this power. And this power is going to enable you to be my witnesses. Because power to live a life pleasing to God is a very powerful thing. Power to be a witness for God is a very powerful thing. Why was Jesus so popular? Why was Jesus so effective and so influential in his culture, in his society, in the cities and countries that he visited? Because he had this power. Nobody could entrap him where it showed that he was a false prophet. No one had the power to make him say, well, yeah, I guess I'll just stop doing all this. Even when confronted with death, because this power was upon him, he knew what he had to do. People are drawn to a life that reflects God. They'll come out of the woodwork. They'll come running. Think about the people who've come to you and said, hey, could you pray with me about this? Why would they know that you're a praying person? Because they've watched you. People are always watching. And when they find somebody who has a mind and heart for God, they store that knowledge. I bet you're thinking about someone who's come to you lately and said, would you pray with me about this? Hey, what would you do in this situation? People are drawn to lives that are well lived for God they are because there is a power there Jesus said hey why don't you be the salt and light and that's not what he said what did he say you are the salt and you are the light it's not like well today I am you know I tell people on Fridays when Nancy and I are out in the car and we're driving around I go places I say it's my day off I get to annoy people And Nancy's like, how is that any different from any other day? We don't get to choose when we have a heart that's undivided. It's every day and in every way. Salt and light. But power is also influence. In the political world, I'll tell you that. If you have power, you have influence. And we have power. And we have influence. Even when we don't see it, we're influencing people. Well then, another thing holiness does for us is it brings peace. You know that inner rebellion that we struggle with? Where we match our will versus God's will, thinking that somehow we might work out some nice little, you know, negotiation where he gets Sundays and maybe two other days of the week. And then we get the rest of them. Or he can have, he can have say, over 89% of my life, but that other 11%, that's where I have control. When he's asking for all of it. Not demanding it, but asking for it. And this inner rebellion that happens when we try to negotiate. I was going to use the word fight, but none of us fight with God. We negotiate with God. Well, we fight, but it's more spiritual to say negotiate. So we're negotiating. Or we use this spiritual phrase. God and I are praying about this situation. Which means God has spoken, and I have not gotten to the place where I can say to him, yes. We're still praying about that. This inner rebellion, if we're not careful, will destroy our power, destroy our peace. It will destroy our influence. It is an ongoing thing. God's Holy Spirit is relentless. Is it not? Has he ever been on you about something? When did he back off? He took Tuesdays off? No. He doubled up on Tuesdays. He was always, in every turn, you stop reading your Bible, and God said, okay, I'm going to make this commercial speak to you. And you're like, well, that's not right. Something on Facebook showed up. The exact verse that you've been arguing with God about, and now God's got it on Facebook. How does God get control over Facebook? I thought Mark had all that power. The Lord God can speak. And he can speak in ways that are untypical. 
this inner rebellion. This struggle of rebellion is described by Paul in Romans chapter 7, verses 25, 21 through 25. He says this, So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking about the war that wages in all of us. A war that can be settled. A war that can be won. Not an armistice, not a ceasefire, but one that is put down. The rebellion is quelled. And this inner conflict is the reason we struggle in life. It really is. If you're at war with God over his will for your life, you're going to be in a bad place. And God is going to speak to you in ways that you cannot discount. I was uh, at Auburn. I was in my, um, at a, an apartment with a roommate. And I woke up to him wiping my brow with alcohol. Yes, I asked him in no uncertain terms what he was doing. He said, you have been beating the wall with your fist till it's bloody. And my fist was bloody. He said, what are you going through in your mind? Well, I didn't share with him, but the Lord had called me to preach. And I said, that'd be a great thing for everybody else, but I'm not going to do that. And God was speaking to me in ways that got my attention. He can speak in ways that you cannot say, well, that was, that was the bad pizza I had last night. No, God can speak in a ways that he autographs his love with his signature and you say, maybe it'd be better to go along with him because this other way is terrible. We struggle. We, we, we wonder why things are like they are, and it's more than likely because he's saying this, and you're saying, well, I think there's another way. I think there's something else we could do. And we begin to negotiate with God. God calls us to holiness, and we want to satisfy our own desires as if we had his wisdom and his eyesight, he sees way beyond today. It results in great conflict. We want God, but we also want what we want. That seems fair. The result is inner turmoil and spiritual stagnation. Have you leveled out someplace, plateaued with the Lord? You know where you need to be with him? At that last decision that he asked you to make and you either tried to put it off you ignored it or you said the timing is not right which are all great human excuses but none of them are a reason there is a way to move from rebellion to obedience and that is total obedience there's no halfway measure it's not like well if I get 51% I'm doing really well it's pass-fail. You either are obedient in all of your life, or you're not obedient. And the devil loves it when we say we believe, then prioritize everything in our lives ahead of God. A.W. Tozer said that. Well, how do you get to this total obedience? It starts with consecration. Setting ourselves apart to God. Not part of it, but all of it. Just giving all of it to God. It requires sacrifice. I put God first in all things. Even over that stuff in the closet that he doesn't know about. So we think. I choose to do his will even when it seems difficult. I choose to do his will even when it is difficult. Even when it costs me. Because it's not really costing me. It's a down payment 
on what he wants to do later in your life. God provides the cleansing power, and it's available to us. And this morning, as we work towards our time of prayer, lots of things that we could pray about. But if you're here this morning, and you're in negotiations with the Lord God Almighty, I would tell you to capitulate. I would tell you that whatever he's offering is the very best thing. And you can surrender yourself to that in a simple prayer. I'm sorry, Lord. You're right. May it be in my life as you want it to be. Give me an undivided heart. May, I, may my attention always be directed towards you. And so as, the, as, we sort, as we worship and as we prepare our hearts for prayer, we invite you to a place to pray or pray where you're at. Uh, this is really for people that are just tired of living in that battle between you and God. We'll pray for some other things, but if you'd like to pray about that specifically, we invite you to do so this morning. Stand and sing I am a child 
Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your presence, your presence that you've promised to us to always be with us when we gather in your son's name. We thank you for your spirit that's fallen upon us and is working in our hearts and lives. We sense this morning, Father, that you're speaking to all of us. And Father, as we allow the Holy Spirit to examine our lives, We open the doors to closets and rooms that we would rather you not see. And we ask, Lord God, that you would come in and do something with that mess. Father, I pray today for people that are in deep negotiations with you, trying to justify what's going on in their lives. Father, that you'd speak to their hearts. More than anything, you would just impress upon them that you know what you're doing and you have a plan for their lives. Father, we surrender our wills to you today. We ask that you would fill us with your power, the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would cleanse us. You'd call us to a life after death, a life that is a life of holy living. Father, that you'd be with us directing us that you would tune our hearts to listen to your voice Father you're such a great God we stand amazed in your presence we glorify your holy name Father we're, we're left just wondering why you would choose to be like this but Father help us to live because you are like this Father, we pray that you'd continue to make this a place of forgiveness, a place of freedom, and a place of family. We ask that you would empower us to live for you and to live lives of influence in the world around us. Father, we pray for our new believers that you would continue to help them grow up as Christians, speaking to their hurts and their problems, but also to their successes and their obedience. Father, be with those who mourn today. Be with our sick and our homebound. Be with those that are awaiting surgery and procedures. May all these give testimony to your goodness, your faithfulness, and your love. Father, we pray that you'd be with our world. Help us to be the salt and light. Help us to stand upon your word and to not be moved. Be with our governmental leaders around the world. We lift them up to you, Lord, and ask that you would speak to them in ways that they would know and understand. That they would uh, turn their hearts towards you. Father, we love you today. We thank you for answering prayer. Continue to work in our lives. For we ask this, Jesus, in your name. Amen and amen. Sure, go right ahead, Bunny.
Someone else this morning? Always appropriate. If there's no one else, I'm going to move on. We call this the Kim Ray rule. She would always wait until the pastor said something, and then she'd stand up. I have to say this. So we call it the Kim Ray rule. She would always wait every time. No one else? It's good to see you today. So glad that you're in. The, you chose to be here. So good to you're choosing to watch online. And um, good to know that he loves us here and there. My information is on the uh, screen for you there. And uh, you can call me at one of those two places, or you can te- um, email me there and be glad to make contact with you. Offering plates in the back, three different ways you can give. We really appreciate it. And we're trusting in you as you trust in God in these days. Um, we're rebounding from 150 something thousand dollars in HVAC units and roofing for the gym. Um, but there hasn't been anybody that said, boy, that was a waste of money. We go in there, and we do do a lot of ministry in that building. Didn't really think about it, but a lot of ministry in that building. And it's so nice to walk in there, and there's no noise. The Lord's taking care of us. There's some other stuff that's been done that's, we believe, stopped the leaking in this roof. So the Lord's good to us. Let's trust in him. Now, this Tuesday night, there'll be uh, the pickleball. At 6 o'clock, there'll be food. Um, if you're not a part of that discussion, and I would encourage you not to be because it gets out of hand very, very quickly. But if you want to be, talk to um, uh, Pat Pickleball Louie, and she will get you. Yeah. Hey, Sally, we're going to talk to you. If you could get it to Pat just as quick as you could, we'd appreciate Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So, there's always some kind of food. Sometimes it's really, really surprisingly good. Okay? Uh, that will go on, and we start pickleball about 6.30. I talked to somebody, and they said, are y'all still playing pickleball up there? I said, yeah. They said, well, I haven't got an invitation. I said, you got one. You get that one invitation. That's for the rest of your life. Don't be asking if you can come. Why don't you just show up? More and more. I had 21 not too long ago. That was a lot. Oh, I do need to tell you this. All the heckling seats have been sold. Okay? We're, that's $25 a night, but all of those, you can get, we have a waiting list now, okay? The only, which, only thing you do now is you have to come and play, all right? And in between games, you're not playing, you may add some advice to the people who are playing. Hey, uh, we had our first uh, Wednesday night uh, Bible study in Abraham. There will not be one this week, but the week following will be in Abraham too. Uh, the second Saturday Supper Club is on May 13th. It's going to be it's going to be a, a soiree. It's going to be a shindig. It's going to be a hullabaloo. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a birthday party for a young lady in our church. And so uh, we're looking forward to that. It will be 6 o'clock here in the fellowship hall. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we begin our celebration with the, uh, the Obots who will be here. They're the missionaries from Malawi where we were drilling wells. The goal was 100. Oh, do we... You have no idea of what clean water does for people. That's what one of the wells look like. Is that from Malawi, Jeff? Okay. 
this is a typical well like the wells we were uh, drilling. They'll be here tonight and be exciting to hear the story from their viewpoint. Uh, food at 5. Uh, if you'd like to come help Jeff, he's going to be here about 3 o'clock cooking. You want to do that? I, am, I don't want to say this, but I'm going to say it because it looks like we're going to have the food we need. So if you're making food, we're counting on it. But there could be 60 people here. So it's going to be a, a group. We're going to be here in this building, in that fellowship hall. If you want to get here early and help us set up, we'd appreciate it. Um, and then if you could stay and help us tear down, take down, throw away, that'd be good as well. Uh, very, very excited about that. The sign-up sheet's in the uh, foyer on the desk. If you'd want to just let us know about how many and um, what foods you'll be bringing. Uh, my understanding is we have potato salad and coleslaw. Some desserts are needed. I told somebody that they could bring seven desserts or one seven-layer cake. That's what I thought. Okay, what else will we need? Some chips and dip. Somebody wants to bring some tea. All that would be good. Jeff, when you turn on the ice maker. And uh, just really looking forward to that, okay? Uh, Redeemed will be singing tonight, and uh, that will be exciting. So we'll have a little mini concert, and then uh, the, uh, the robots will be speaking. All right, our district superintendent will be here. It's going to be in, uh, quite a night. People from Pleasant Grove, um, Gardendale, and um, Faith Church in the Nazarene will all be here. So it's going to be a good thing. Probably some others will show up from other places. So it's really, really going to be a good time. Here's what I'd like for you to know. That we can live in such a way that those who know us but don't know God will come to know God because they know us. That we might live lives of influence. That we are the salt and light to the people around us. Let's read the Apostles' Creed together. Here's what we believe. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church of Jesus Christ, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Receive this benediction. Father, we thank you that you have renewed our love and our understanding of you this morning. Allow us now to go out into the world that does not know your love and has no understanding of you. Through the influence you've given to us, through the power that we've been made available through the Holy Spirit, would you allow us to speak for you? Watch over us, continue to watch over us, that we might be your people, live a life that's pleasing to you and attractive to the world. May God bless you, you're dismissed, to go in love and serve our risen King.